I am Marcy Bynum Robertson and welcome to this session for the Six Bridges Book Festival. And I'll be your moderator today for this great session that has a few Arkansas ties, as we'll find out. And I'm happy you're here today. I wish we could all be in person, but um, maybe next year that'll happen. And maybe our authors will have new books and come back next year to, to speak. So the first thing we'll do is I'll introduce the author in their book, and then you, they can talk a little bit about what their influences are in terms of their selection of subject and genre. And then we can respond to questions. If you want to put questions in the chat section, and we'll just kind of play that by ear as to whether we want to answer them as we go along or answer them at the end, because I don't want to lose a frame of reference if we have a question that needs immediate answering to previous context. So our first book today is Hell on the Border. And this is this is a, a book, this is a subject we are all somewhat familiar with, uh, thanks to living in Arkansas and, and our Western border. And Dr. Sidney Thompson is the author of Hell on the Border, which is book two of the Bass Reeves trilogy. And we're all very excited about mm -hmm. Bass Reeves. Anyone that's interested in African-American history and then Western history, we he's, he's important to us. Um, Dr. Thompson is a writing consultant for the William L. Adams Center for Writing and serves as the center's liaison with the Bright Divinity School. He teaches writing for the English department at TCU and is uh, also African American literature. So for the Master in Liberal Arts program, is all that up to date and correct? That's all right. That's right. Okay. That's right. And he held a PhD in American fiction with specializations in creative writing and African American narratives and an MFA in creative writing. He grew up in Memphis, so not too far from us. And um, one of the things I think that you may be talking about is your influence in growing up in Memphis on your selection of genre and writing style. So that's right. Yes. And then, so we also have author Diana Rostad. And is that the correct pronunciation? It is Rostad instead yes. of Rostad. <laughs> she was. She was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest and her parents and extended family, it's kind of far flung from the ranches of Montana and also farms of Arkansas. So we, I think we'll probably want to make that connection and hear a little bit about that. And after raising her three children, she went to a SMU Writer's Path program in 2009 and she's traveled extensively for her research. And in fact, today she's coming to us from a roadside in Montana, right? I'm on and my way to Missoula. <laughs> so. uh, she's traveled extensively for her research, which is something we historians like to do, of course. And she now lives in Florida. She's worked with youthful offenders in California. And I think that she's going to talk probably about how that has influenced her work and, and her characters in this story. So do y'all want to uh, flip a coin to see who gets to kind of start out first and talk about your influences or you can read a passage if you like and kind of prompt the discussion well you know i can go ahead and start if you like okay um, so you know i grew up out west and you know the book setting for you belong here now um and i'll show you the you belong here now i don't know if that's oh. back do you see it backwards okay <laughs> there we go um, yeah so Yep, that's it. So, you know, I came to the setting in kind of a, a long winding way. You know, I, like she said, I worked with youthful offenders in South Central Los Angeles. And when I was younger, my it was my first big girl job. And it was very simply put, it was my job to get these guys a job. And so I would um, find them on the inside when they were still incarcerated. And then when they paroled, I'd go out and take them and get them a pair of clothes, take them to job interviews, to get them anything it took to get them employed. And so, you know, back, and that was, you know, and leaving that, you know, job, you know, it was the best. I mean, honestly, other than being an author, that was an amazing job helping those kids. But, you know, later on to, you know, fly back to fly forward to 2006, 2007, here I am, you know, I'm a fledgling writer and I'm on the internet and I come across this 
article about the orphan train and I see all of these pictures of these kids, you know, who'd been cleaned up, had, you know, got a new suit of clothes, were put on a train, you know, to go be, you know, gainfully employed um, under, you know, work employment type contracts um, or just plain old adopted, depending on what age you were. So I just saw something so similar in these kids and these old photos, you know, this look of hope and determination, you know, they had lived on the streets without shoes and, and you know, running around in gangs and, you know, filching food. And so they, they reminded me of the kids that I worked with in South Central Los Angeles. They, the same kind of backgrounds, tough, tough beginning in life. And so I knew I was the right person to write this book. I just didn't know where to set it. And then one Christmas, my dad comes to, um, comes down to Texas to visit me and he brings all of these amazing photos of the old family ranches. And it just broke open this whole wide world where I could finally see my characters inside it. And so, you know, from there, it was pretty natural to start basing, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in the book, you know, songs that my grandfather sang. I'll, I'll read you one of them, actually. I marked them off. I'm on the road. Can you tell? I've got a $20 bet. <laughs> my flight was canceled to Missoula, so <laughs> I just hit the road in a truck. So here's the song I want to read to you. And this is kind of an old legend um, in Canada and Montana. And here's what he used to sing. The old side hill gouger had to stay on the hill, couldn't walk on level ground. So he went round the hill and never could come down. So we ran like the devils straight down. And so this was kind of like, it was a song, but it was more like a fable to keep the kids inside at night, you know, to keep them off the hills. You know, there are coyotes and wolves out there. And so the old side hill gouger is kind of this old legend with, you know, lopsided legs and um, as long as you ran down the hill, you'd be okay, because he couldn't run down the hill with his lopsided legs. So <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense at all, but these were sort of the, the legends and things, you know, that, you know, in my grandfather's time in early 20th century Montana that they sang. So, um, you know, with that, I don't know, do you want me to read a passage in the beginning of my book, or how do you want to do it? Well, one of the things that interested me was in... As a history person, I went and looked at the origins of the orphan trains in on the East Coast. And yeah. so in Arkansas, we had two different groups that sent children here. One of them mm -hmm. was a group of Catholic nuns that sent children here and they were placed through the Subiaco Academy, which is in Ooh. West Arkansas. And so yeah. then we also had the other group that you discuss and that you have discussed. But mm -hmm. I think that your three, the three kids in the book represent kind of the typical circumstances that these kids would end up in to be yeah. put into this program so if you would talk a little bit about that because i think that oh sure this this festival tends to attract people who are real interested in the backstory of things the history so if you could talk yes. a little bit about the circum those circumstances i think that would be real interesting sure you know um the orphan train history is is kind of interesting because the catalyst to all of that homelessness was actually the building of the railroad itself. <laughs> Believe it or not, you know, these, um, the oil barons, you know, back then and, you know, mid 19th century, there wasn't many people out West and they were going to build these things. And what they needed was commerce, people to move out there and people on the Eastern seaboard pretty much knew what the deal was out there. They, they were, you know, they didn't want to go. So these oil barons put up all these, you know, posters all, all over the place in Europe and beyond saying free land, land of milk and honey. And so tons of people came, you know, fleeing, you know, starvation, war, revolutions. And, you know, little did they know that once they got to our Eastern seaboard that it would take money. You needed provisions and wagons to go West. You and, and a lot of these people, they, you know, they came in just their clothes. And so they ended up on the Eastern seaboard and, you know, starvation set in, food shortages, disease, you know, really rampant. And so what people started doing was they started to abandon their children. Like they would abandon their babies on the, you know, the steps of, you know, wealthy people's homes, or they would take them to the, the foundling hospital. And, you know, 4.3 million people came in, you know, in that last half of the 19th century. And so 
At one time in New York, there was 30,000 children living on the streets without shoes, without food, homeless children. If you can imagine that 30,000 back in that time, that's a lot of kids. And so what, you know, and, and it wasn't long before they were running around in their own gangs, filching food, doing whatever they could to survive. You know, they'd, um, they, I, some of this, you know, the photos you see of these kids just all in balls like puppy dogs in the corners, you know, just to stay warm at night, you know, because it gets cold in New York. And so, you know, Charles Loring Brace was a method minister. And so he saw all of this, you know, terrible homelessness and he and a group of businessmen got together and founded the Children's Aid Society. And so they founded orphanages, they founded um, Newsies um, houses where the, the Newsy kids, the girls and boys, could go at night and they were like homeless shelters. They could eat, they could get food, um, you know, clean their clothes, warm bed. But at the end of the night, they were back out on the streets. So, you know, one of the most, and what they're most known for, the Children's Aid Society, is coming up with this great idea to, of the orphan train to put, you know, to clean up these kids, um, put, give them two suits of clothes, one, one they're wearing, one with a little suitcase, and they would be escorted on this train out to the heartland and the west and beyond. And there would be, um, they would always uh, go ahead, all of their stops. They had already had liaisons in place. They had had posters put up. So people knew these kids were coming. And so they, they would go to these stops and they'd all line up, whether it was on a stage in a playhouse or in a church or right there on the train platform. And, you know, they'd kind of be, you know, picked over some people, you know, there were, there were um, very young kids who went out there, there was infants at times. And so you did really have people who wanted these children. But then, you know, the, the society was so smart, they had a real true adoption contract. And then they had sort of a work program contract where, you know, that they protected both sides. And if you were 14 and under you, you know, had to be in every way treated like a member of the family. But if you were 15 and up, they really did think that you were being taken on for labor. And so they protected those kids by saying they need this, this, and this. And when they're 18, you have to pay them. And, and they weren't, you know, obligated to stay beyond the age of 18. So they could move on. Um, so that's kind of how it worked. Um, you know, with, and they did have liaisons who would keep in touch with these kids and make sure that things were going well. They did request letters from the kids. But I think with every, with any, um, you know, uh, program, you're going to get, um, you know, people are running it. So you're, there's going to be problems. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be terrible things that are going to happen. I mean, it was a 75 year program. It ran from 1853 to 1929. Uh, it went to 45 states, Canada and Mexico. I think there's, uh, at least the children's, uh, AIDS Society placed out, I think, 120,000 children over the life of the 75-year program, 76-year program. So it was a very long-running program in our history. And in a role that Arkansas, I don't know, did you look into the Arkansas role in this program? Or I did just, just part? Well, uh, one of our writers, Mary Ellen Johnson, who was in Northwest Arkansas, came across this. And like you, she was just kind of shocked you know, and in 1986, she founded the Orphan Train Heritage Society of America in Northwest Arkansas. So the first reunion oh. was in 1989. And so they had, um, according to what I've read, they had 32 writers, which is what they called the kids. And then there was a pair yeah. of brothers that was reunited because the, the siblings were often separated, which is it's yeah. a very sad thing to have to go through. But I was surprised to see that they were placed all over the state and Fort Smith, Rogers, Little Rock, Conway, you know, a lot of places, even in Jonesboro. So that's pretty far flung Ooh, to be in Arkansas. Jonesboro. That's where so, my mother's from, Jonesboro. Oh, okay. So she's from Northeast Arkansas. Yay, mm -hmm. Red Wolves. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, that's the ASU football team. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of Arkansas's role in this. And so we did have some, and then as I said, the Sisters of Charity in New York also sent students or also sent young people and they were placed in Catholic homes thanks to the the men the, the at Subiaco Academy. So that was kind of interesting. 
So, um, Sydney, would you like to talk? Uh, we can kind of switch gears and talk about your influences and what prompted you to write about Bass Reeves and kind of uh, that western edge of our state. Okay, good. Um, so I'm from Memphis, and my hometown definitely influenced my project of the Bass Reeves trilogy. Uh, I mean, growing up in Memphis with the civil rights uh, era, just it's ongoing. Uh, it attracts attention always. So I just kind of grew up in the shadows of, of hearing about Dr. Martin Luther King and my father, uh, a very rare case. Here's an individual who in the seventies taught what was then called black English. And he, he taught, uh, you know, raise it in the sun and he would cover these books and then he would uh, give me these books to read. And I, I thought black English, black literature was my literature in uh, the music. Uh, the, the city is filled with e examples of, of whites and blacks and harmony, despite, you know, the, the, the tragedies that we hear of, that have happened there. Um, so, I felt comfortable writing about race. I've always written about race. And it just so happened that I was watching CNN one day um, back in two, 2009 or 10. And Morgan Freeman was being interviewed. He was promoting a movie, I don't remember which, but at the end of the interview, he was asked, what would be your dream role? And he said, well, there's this cat named Bass Reeves. Nobody really knows about him, uh, but, but he was the most successful lawman of the Wild West and nobody's ever tackled him. No, nobody's written about him and I would love to play Bass Reeves. And so as a storyteller, I'm, I'm like, you mean there's a story, an important historical story people don't know about? Um, I, I want, I want that. I want to write that story. So, I, I found out that there was really one legitimate book out on him, nonfiction. It wasn't a, a narrative that you could follow, but it was a wonderful treasure trove for someone like me, uh, with uh, interviews, court documents. Since Bass Reeves was a, a deputy marshal out of Fort Smith, Arkansas, you know, he he would have to provide testimony and trial. So there were court documents, there were news, uh, newspaper articles about him, you know, during his time uh, about his exploits. There were interviews of marshals and whatever, all these, all this wonderful, all these documents. And I just got sucked in and I wanted to write his story. I wanted to to learn how this African-American deputy U.S. Marshal could have become a U.S. Marshal, a, a deputy U.S. Marshal, could have been so successful having a career that lasted 32 years that far surpasses his white counterparts, Wyatt Earp, et cetera. I mean, it, not, they don't come close to what he accomplished, arresting over 3,000 outlaws, uh, he, he killed more th than any, but he didn't even prefer to, to kill. He, he, he had this um, policy or um, to really practice nonviolence. He's a precursor of the civil rights movement. I mean, he wanted to arrest whenever possible, avoid violence whenever possible, um, because partly he wanted to save them. I mean, he really did believe in freedom and he was hoping to arrest them, preach to them, save them. He was a very devout man and he wanted a chance to turn their lives around or their souls around and, and not go in guns blazing. And so some of the mystique around him has inspired uh, one prominent historian, Art Burton uh, from Oklahoma, to argue that 
Bass Reeves is, was the inspiration for the Lone Ranger. Um, whether he was or wasn't, I don't see any clear uh, evidence of it, but he, he was the essence of the Lone Ranger before the Lone Ranger. He preferred nonviolence, he, he wore disguises. So there's a very, and, and he preferred nonviolence. There's a very modern aspect to him that intrigued me because he upset everything that I thought I knew about race in this country, how he could have upset so many expectations, uh, been permitted to do that. And then this history has been whitewashed away. And as a white author, as a Southerner, as someone from, uh, from Arkansas, so to speak, I'm from Memphis, but I, I did go to uh, University of Arkansas in Fayetteville to get my Master of Fine Arts. And so th this man from Arkansas, who should be a household name, has been whitewashed. I felt now that I had learned about that he existed, I, there was a, I felt a, a little bit of responsibility to get the word out. Uh, it, so um, that, that's what I decided to do. And I thought I was just gonna be one book, but his life is so rich. Uh, I decided to, I couldn't do it all in one book. So I, I, I published the first book, Follow the Angels, Follow the Doves that came out last year. This year, Hell on the Border, and, and I'm working on the third one. Great. So do you see any bass reefs in Rooster Cogburn or not? Because that's kind of a cultural myth. So what's your what's your expert opinion on that? Well, I feel like R Rooster Cogburn is uh, is rougher around the edges than bass reefs. Yes. Yes. Um, bass reefs was not willing to ignore the law. Now, I'm not saying he did make a mistake. And I don't want to give away too much of my right. hair <laughs> at the end of Hell on the Border. Um, but uh, Bass Reeves was consistent. He did have a code of ethics. And, uh, he was a devout man. So if his preacher breaks the law, all right, preacher. Yes, he, he arrested his, his preacher. His son <laughs> commits murder. And later in life, he goes and hunts down his own son. Um, so there was a line that you could cross with him. And, uh, he wasn't going to fold. Uh, he, he didn't have glaring weaknesses. And, and that's part of the mystique. I mean, he seems, he, all the evidence and all the interviews, everything I've sifted through, he lived up to the larger in life figure um and uh he was a better man than rooster cogburn i love the character of rooster but he's not as complicated as bass reeves right right there's uh his iron fist isn't in a velvet glove like uh <laughs> bass reeves hat yes and so bass reeves I, I mean reading the dialogue in your book it he seems almost like an avenging angel or a philosopher in his approach to law enforcement actually i wanted his agency to be strong okay here's a man who's had to navigate when he was enslaved he had to always have this double identity you know present one side to his to his master or whites in general he had his own his own perspective and uh i tried to show how those there's a seesaw effect and how they it, how they kind of um, emerge and, or evolve over time from the first book to the to the second book where you see his own identity growing uh his confidence growing and um his his faith played a role in helping him really be confident in a world that was largely against him. And mm -hmm. so I, I didn't want to shy away from, his, from that aspect of his character, even though an agent uh, once dropped me uh, because she said, well, there, this, is, this character is too religious. 
and I, I couldn't betray the character. He he was a faithful guy. It didn't mean everything he did was was good. Um, he thought it was good at the time what he was doing, um, but you know so his faith and his background as an enslaved individual, I thought made him a very thoughtful, intellectual, phil philosophical character mm -hmm. uh, because he had to, he had, he had to be a loner so much of the time that I need that voice to kind of carry the story. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I think that I accidentally shut off my video, so we'll have to um, see if I can get that back for us. Not that that's that important, but um, so one of the things that um, struck me also about Bass, uh, you talk about he believed in freedom. Can you talk a little bit about his early, in a, in, I mean, the connections to art, because he grew up in Van Buren, right? But then he also spent time in some other states. That's right. He he was born on a plantation right outside of Van Buren, and his master was an intellectual. He was uh, he was a Tennessee politician and a, a prominent one. And during the Civil War, this uh, this master's son, who is uh, a ca a cavalry officer for in Texas, and he is a future prominent politician for Texas. He, he becomes the uh, Speaker of the House in, in Texas. So I did want uh, to kind of illustrate that he's, he's learning some of that, that education from them. You know, he, he's gleaning as much as he can from what they say, what they read, um, and so during the Civil War, just before his son goes off uh, to fight for the Confederacy, the father gives Bass to his son to be his body servant. And so Bass Reeves, and this is according to what we know about his history, he, he claimed that he did attend battles in Arkansas and in Missouri. So uh we have good reason to understand how he could have become the great lawman i mean having that experience witnessing battles his mas his master was an officer sitting in on officer meetings hearing all of this how does this inform him strategically later to become a great lawman so i try to use that as much as i can um, and the relationship is quite different from the father and master and the son master um, because I noticed Bass Reeves grows very impatient with the second master and 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 wants and wants his freedom uh, where where he didn't attempt to to run away before so, um so at, at age 26 i thought it came late so that helped me sort of construct uh characters where the the father master uh was more like a, a father figure he did take bass reeves to turkey shoots once he learned that bass reeves could fire a gun and was a marksman and so there, there was something of a relationship with them. The, the father, uh, William Reeves, wanted Bass Reeves to have his name. That's why Bass is called Reeves, Bass Reeves. So there seems to be a, somewhat of a, like a, a, a kinder, more privileged, if you will, uh, relationship there as Bass is a house slave and a, a servant to the master directly. And given some privileges of leaving the plantation and shooting guns and competing and being so good at these turkey shoots that he was banned from them eventually. <laughs> um, but everything shifts with the sun. Um, 
And so their, their characters are quite different. Yes. Um, so Diana kind of shifting gears. Um, I looked at the like book club and, and review questions that came with your book and that, you, that I've seen online. And you have so many themes running through your book. It's, it's really interesting that you tackled so many different and, and also, um, I mean, everything from racism to wild Mustangs and a little bit of environmentalism there. And in addition to the, the, the socio-political circumstances from leading from them coming from the East coast to different parts of the country. So, yeah. um, did you intend to have such a, a broad range with that, or is it just kind of what came out as a result of your research and where the characters led you? I mean, can you pull out some of the important, uh, my dad grew up in Eastern Oklahoma, which was actually in Indian territory in Latimer County. And so in his experience growing up in a town of immigrants, cause it was a mining community, um, the African-American school burned down. And so the only kids there, uh, assimilated into the to the white school but then the native american kids were sent off to go to other schools and mm -hmm. so that struck me in your book as a storyline that really stood out to me is very interesting and and i don't want to give away any spoilers so i may want to talk to you after this about how one of the storylines <laughs> ended up and why you chose to do something that was frustrating to me as a reader so um <laughs> Uh -huh. Yes, I'm sure you probably know, exactly, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I do know exactly what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> um, but, so, yeah, so, the, you know, the book covers a wide expanse of America. Right. You know, we're talking about, you know, kids who come from, you know, New York City, you know, Hell's Kitchen. And, and so they, and even Patrick comes from Ireland, you know, and so, and there's some really big working parts in this this time frame. I mean, you've got women's rights that are evolving. You know, Nara's, you know, she wants to cut her hair short and, you know, she wants to run that ranch. And, you know, I think in general, everybody is just trying to, to belong in this book, whether it's Nara who wants to be accepted as a ranch woman who is capable of running a large stock operation in 1925, or whether you're Jim, a Native American hand who is just trying to assimilate, you know, into that society, he's trying to get employed um, in, in, in an employment that he loves. I mean, he comes from the mining industry, which he hated. And so, you know, he's just trying to survive like everyone else. And then there's these three kids from New York they just want a place to belong. You know, you've got Patrick who, um, he lost his family to Spanish flu and they, you know, both of the older boys, Patrick and Charles lost both of their fathers in World War I. And of course, Opal is, you know, her parents, you know, were, you know, pretty much settled in New York City, but she's just one of those children who just got lost in the cracks of things to a parent who was just so, you know, addicted to substance, opium, and, you know, just had a terrible time of it. Just the general social conditions and poverty in New York. And so, you know, it's funny because they bring all of these issues with them to Nara, who has, who has grown up in this insular world, right? In this, this one part of the county, and it's all she knows. And so, you know, I think one of the other themes in the book and it's something that I, I firmly believe and you know Nara is all about the rules right in the book and Charles only has one rule and that's don't get caught and so these two butt heads in the book until they come to this middle ground where you know yeah he can't beat the tar out of everybody who makes him mad you know or protecting his siblings and she comes to realize that even if you follow the rules in life, life isn't fair. You know, there that sometimes, you know, the only thing that provides justice in this world is love, you know, and it's not rules and it's not law, it's love. And so that's kind of where these two characters meet up. And yeah, there's a lot of lot of stuff going through the, the book. <laughs> so lots of great book club discussion. 
Yes, I mean, you could do this over several weeks. I can see, uh, kind of choose a different theme for each, each, yeah. uh, each thread of that. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that came out, and I know that you have become involved in this in, in modern mm -hmm. times, are still the issues with the wild Mustangs, which are essentially another character in the book. They are. They're a symbol of, you know, just, I mean, a resource, a beautiful thing, just like these kids, they're a resource, they're a beautiful thing. Um, you know, I was surprised. I, I didn't even know. I grew up out West and I didn't know we had wild horses. And so when I was, you know, placing all of the flora and fauna in this book, um, I discovered these wild horses and particularly I discovered this wild blue roan and oh my gosh. They look like something straight out of Hollywood. They're so beautiful. They look blue in certain lights, but they're really a black and white speckle with a black mane and feet and all. They're just gorgeous. And so I did a lot of research on them and I discovered they were, you know, being rounded up back in 1925 to be canned down to chicken feed. And and so it's it it's a big part of the, you know, the the plot in the book. Um, and I won't say more because I hate to blow plots. <laughs> But for me personally, I, I have become involved. We, we have, um, because they're still rounding these horses up to preserve forage for cattle, essentially, that our own government, the, the BLM is doing this. And so um, what we wanna do is just stop the roundups. And um, so me and another friend who is one of the wild horse photographers, um, we started, we're gonna start a campaign where we bring in a whole coalition. We bring everybody together because there's a lot of, a lot of horse camp, a lot of horse um, organizations out there. And so we just want to get together 20,000 letters. And then we're going to be real noisy about getting those letters to the White House. And we're going to just knock on the gate and say, we have these letters. We want to give these to Biden. Um, it's important. So that's, that's sort of something I'm working on right now. Um, you know, the horses that are out there they're not feral. Um, there's some uh, research that um, Yvette Running Horse Colin has done up at uh, University of um, Alaska in Fairbanks. And it, it's very, it, these horses have been here for thousands of years and they're not, they weren't brought over on a ship by the Spanish. They're, they, they genetically have determined that these, these horses are native. And so um, yeah, I'm very passionate about it. And in my book, Patrick is also very passionate about it. He's a real horse kid. Whereas Charles, who comes from the city, um, is tried it on <laughs> by his Appaloosa at every moment. And it's there's some really cute moments in the books between in the book between Charles and his Appaloosa, which is very aptly named Charge. <laughs> so I've got a segue. Uh, fit uh, I could tie into that if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, Go uh, ahead. And Diana. All right. So you shared a song and then you're talking about horses. And I'm thinking, well, I've got a song about a horse. Can I, <laughs> can I share that? Yes. <laughs> is, it named, right. is it named Strawberry? Yes. <laughs> wow. Um, I, all right. Good. So notoriously, for whatever reason, whenever Bass Reeves was heading out of town, when I say town, I mean Fort Smith, to go into Indian Territory or present day Oklahoma, it, it would always start raining. And so he had a habit of saying, get ready for bad weather, boys. So I, I work in that line here in this scene. So he and his outfit, uh, Floyd and Willie, he's got a posse man and a cook. And those three are going into Indian Territory. And He's kind of trying to get into the mood. He's leaving his civilized state, so to speak, and becoming the lawman. And so I, I kind of wanted this song to kind of help him get in the get, get into character. Um, Bass tilted his head back to soak up the scent and tick tick of rain. Get ready for bad weather, boys. He called and clicked his tongue for Strawberry to jump ahead into a trot to get out in the lane before more horses and carriages and wagons wouldn't let them. I should have said he's, he's just now leaving a hanging. Um, it was as if God disapproved that men should have to spend their lives hanging men like the cold irons or chasing men like Jim Webb 
instead of staying home and was pressed to show it with air and rain that smelled and tasted this sweet from other places. So to the mud under hooves, Bass decided to sing, God's wrath is with me on my high horse beneath me. He liked the cadence of his verse, a new one. So he sang it again, only louder. God's wrath is with me on my high horse beneath me. He wished Jenny were seated at her piano up on the boardwalk on Garrison Avenue, playing something to go under the words as they passed. Needing another verse, but not knowing where to go yet, he started with repetition, remembering in the slave quarters how that was Uncle Mosley's way when stuck. On my high horse, my high horse, I ride by so many saloons and whores, but worse are the happy death watchers, watch them shut up their doors. He started to miss the first verse, so he went back to it. God's wrath is with me, on my high horse beneath me. Then he missed the second one, on my high horse, my high horse. And then as the rain began to whip, he wanted to add something new. I ride straight for you, Jim Webb, and I will get you, of course. Sing it, Floyd bellowed above the rattling of chains and the fall of rain, the slosh of wheels missing ruts. So Bass sang it, digging in. Do you hear my steed's hooves? Do you see the clouds rain? Jim Webb, are you listening? I've got a writ, there's your name. Jim Webb, Jim Webb, why are you running again? Don't you know running free without a right is one devil of a sin? So heed this warning, old friend, if you decide once more to shoot, we will make the same money just by bringing back your boots. It's kind of fun <laughs> writing in the Western genre. I, I grew up in Memphis, as I've talked about. My, my, family, my, my family really comes from Mississippi, my, both of my parents. So I always thought of myself as a Southern writer, but Bass Reeves, and he starts in the South. And he, you know, over, the, over time he heads West and it, it was fun to be dragged along with him and, and become kind of a Western writer. I'm, I'm enjoying this and Diana, uh, that's your, that's your feel. That's your, that's your world. West. <laughs> Western life, Western culture, Western literature. So there, there is a fun aspect. You work songs, jokes. There's, there's horror, of course. Yeah. But there, there, there's a lightness, too. Uh, do you, does that work in your, in your fiction as well? Fun, light moments, uh, uh, unexpected humor. Yeah, you know, the, the unexpected humor is, is so understated, but, you know, Westerners are big on hyperbole, um, and it always, it's always surrounding nature. So, you know, right in the first, you know, first page of the book, you'll hear a foot-long grasshopper, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Stuff like that, or, or, you know, couldn't find her, you know, a whisper in the, like a white feather in a blizzard, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, just things like that. Those are just, I mean, I could come up with those like forever and ever and ever just because I don't know, that's just the way, you know, it, it works out West, you know, they're just huge on hyperbole, but mostly they're just understated and they're, you know, I think, you know, my grandfather, um, I think I heard him sing more than I heard him talk. You know, he'd get up in the morning, he'd get his guitar he goes sit by a window with light. And I always remember he, he'd just be whispering and, you know, strumming his guitar. And then he'd do it again at night. It was almost like he was meditating. Uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of, you know, where I come from, you know, and then my father, uh, you know, he would always wake us up in the morning and everything was butts, you know, chops, fiddles and duds. You know, he'd come into my room and say, get your butt out of bed, go brush your chops and let's have some fiddles and put your duds on and blah, blah, blah. And I just thought everybody's dad talked like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's just, yeah. So, I mean, and my father was a huge influence on, on how I wrote the book and what I read before I even started writing the book. Um, he turned me on to all his Montana writers, Ivan Doig, Larry Watson, 
you know, I read some uh, self-published stuff from Ray Grenston, who was a good friend of my grandfather and a big railroader. The railroad was huge back then. You know, it brought in the early 20th century, it just brought, you know, Montanans, things they would never have seen before. It was like, like in the 90s when we got the internet and it rocked our world, changed our world. Well, that's how it was for Montanans when the trains came in and it just changed my grandfather's whole world. So, and I know you've got trains as a theme, um, Sydney. I think that's something we have in common. We talked about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as I mentioned before, Bass Reeves and other lawmen, I mean, there were about 200 deputy marshals leaving over time uh, from seven, from uh, 1875 to about 1900, there were about 200 deputy marshals and many were killed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most dangerous area of Indian territory, so to speak, uh, was west of the Katy line, the Missouri, Kansas, Texas Railroad. Um, it was the demarcation, it was the border, the real border all right, so if you cross it, you're going into the, the thickest part of the, of the Wild West and your life will be in danger, even, even for lawmen. Uh, so these, these outlaws were hiding out in Indian territory because the, 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 the police, the, the Indian police couldn't, didn't have jurisdiction to do anything about them. So they could they could run around at will until uh, Judge Isaac Parker uh, and the Western District of Arkansas hired Bass Reeves and other deputy deputies and, and marshals. And so I have uh, a, a, a chapter devoted to that 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 relevance of that border. Mm -hmm. um, and there was actually a, a, a nickname for that for the Katy line, how it runs north and south from Kansas to Texas running. Uh, through Indian territory and people called it the deadline. And, and so <laughs> I, you know, so Bass Reeves is definitely aware of uh, to be more on alert than ever when, when crossing it because it was common for outlaws. And I've never seen this in a movie and, I'm, and I, I wanna see it somewhere, uh, especially a, a movie maybe based on my book, you know, that would be my preference, but uh, where you see the wanted poster flipped over and some of these outlaws would flip the poster over and write a message to the outlaw tracking them down. And if they knew who it was, <laughs> they would directly name them. And it happened to Bass Reeves, uh, would flip it over, Bass, you know, and, and leave a message. Uh, so it's, the trains like, brought a lot of people out west. Your people, right? <laughs> but uh, it brought you know people migrated. It brought a lot of crime. So you know, it's unfortunately like my book is focused on that kind of the negative side of what the the trains did for that for that area, you know, temporarily. Mm. And y'all know in eastern Oklahoma, there's actually a state park called Robbers Cave State Park. <laughs> and it's a series of caves where the outlaws would hide out. So they had one area is marked that says Bell Star's bedroom. And it before it had a cave in, they actually it actually had a, a platform where she supposedly slept. And so the James brothers and different folks were in that area. And so they had one area that was a natural stone corral where they could put a, a lookout up high. So it, it's really interesting if anybody's going to Fort Smith and wants to kind of continue on that Western trail to Robbers Cave, mm -hmm. it's outside of Wilburton. And that's that's a real fun area. And, and Bell Star's grave is not far, although you have, to, you have to be looking for it to find it because it took us about an hour one day to find it. So it's on private land. It, you know, Bell Star was arrested, uh, you know, she, she was arrested one time I mean, she turned herself in because she did. She knew Bass Reeves had a subpoena for her, and she didn't want <laughs> to be dragged around throughout the territory in his wagon because <laughs> he wanted to make his money. 
and he would collect the bounties for all the outlaws that he caught. So he became a wealthy man in his lifetime. So he would catch somebody, put them in the wagon, but he might be gone for a month. And can you imagine being in the back of a wagon for a month? <laughs> in, yeah. Out in the weather. Uh, she no, she turned she wouldn't have stood for that. <laughs> No. There's a book in the archives that UA Little Rock called Bella Star Outlaw Queen. And every freshman that had to do a paper that where they said use primary sources, they thought that was a primary source, although we kept telling them, no, this is called fiction. Every student wanted to use that book. So it's Bella Star Outlaw Queen. So I think you're more realistic in your portrayal of uh, what you have in your book. And um, Speaking of portrayals, I mean, you kind of opened up the the movie uh, can of worms there because I know that there's, I think that there was a movie last year, but then now there's a new series coming on Netflix about Bash Reeves. There, there is a, it's called The Harder They Fall with mm -hmm. Idris Elba and, uh, and um, um, Delroy Lindo. And it's it, it's going to be a Netflix m movie. Um, Delroy Lindo does have the name Bass Reeves. I'm not trying to to you know you know ru ruin the party, but from my reading of the summary of the movie, it doesn't it doesn't sound like there's going to be anything remotely historically accurate. I, I watched the trailer and I kind of got that feeling. <laughs> and it, it, Man. The, the outlaw that's portrayed too. I mean, it all takes place in, in an area of Texas where, where Bass Reeves never worked. So I, I, I don't know. It frustrates me about Hollywood. Like when, when I was re reading Bass Reeves, I thought these are like tremendous stories. He had shootouts at point blank range. He had these, these fights that eclipse all the dramatic, uh, you know, uh, acts that you see uh, in in the movies. You know, Gunfight at the OK Corral. I mean, I, I love those movies, but like some of these stories top that, and then they choose to ignore that and come up with their own story, and then paste a name to a character and say, "Oh, I know." the name Bass Reeves is kind of catching on, getting a little attention. So let's use it and, but not use his real life. That it mm -hmm. frustrates me. Well, and I yeah. see that Rufus Buck is the villain of the piece. And I mean, he was a terrible person from what I remember reading right back no, in right. Western history. He right. was horrible. Right. I don't want to see Idris Elba be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Just personal taste, you know. Right, right. Um, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it and I hope it's in well, of course, but, I'm, but I don't expect it to be historically accurate. Just hope that it'll be a, a fun movie. You know, it's going to be another Bella star outlaw queen <laughs> updated. Right. So Diana, we have a, a chat question. Uh, people often think life was so much better back in the good old days, yet the problems in your book a hundred years later are still prominent today. Does that bum you out? Or do you feel hopeful? You know, I do feel hopeful. I think we do bit by bit, you know, year by year, we do make progress. It's kind of like Jim says in the book, you know, it's the angry, you know, the blood, it just, it, you know, it over time, I think over generations, people just let go of things. And so that's good. But then if we have more conflicts, I don't know how that works, but I don't know. I think when I think of how busy we are and how many conveniences we have, you know, um, over what, you know, the folks in my book had, I don't know if we're any better off. I think we are so plugged in, hot wired, brains on fire, kind of, you know, just, I mean, I don't know. It's a real, you know, I'm reading this great book right now called The Nature Fix. And it's all about how nature, you know, just, has the most amazing effect on us and so i don't know i don't know if we're any better off but you know in terms of the conflicts the racist uh stuff the horses i don't know 
we got to make we got we got to make we got to make a lot more progress i think <laughs> so and I'll, well, I'll add like well the black lives matter i mean pol our police being too often just out of control and quick with quick trigger fingers and I, and i just wonder this is an I, this is something that just can't escape me i just wonder if Bass Reeves' story had not been whitewashed. It, maybe I'm just dreaming, but I think if we had allowed his story and not try, uh, deliberately, I, I could get into that, but deliberately erased, uh, and, and we all were aware that there was this famous black lawman, we wouldn't grow up, especially you know, in really white communities, we wouldn't grow up assuming yeah. that black people are on the wrong side of the law, historically, yeah. et cetera, in any way. Um, you know, if police academies, hey, you know who's the best badass we can look up to is Bass Reeves. And despite yeah. the danger, he kept his cool, and he didn't rush to violence. He mm -hmm. used it when necessary, but he didn't always rush to that. And they rush to that right now. They they don't they they yeah. want to kill out of fear. I think uh, this person before they they that person has a chance to pull a weapon or something. But there's so much bias, and Bass Reeves is the opposite of that. He's the antithesis of, of letting people prove themselves, will they submit to him? Uh, he gives them an opportunity to show their, their human value. Will they submit to him, let him arrest them uh, before he chooses violence? And I, I just wish we would hold up that example. It, it, maybe one day we will, um, but if he could do that in the 1800s, my Lord, why can't the, why can't we do that now? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. To me. Well, we know, Cindy, we've got about five minutes left. So we know that you're working on the third book for the trilogy. Yeah. And so, and we hope you get that phone call from, from Netflix <laughs> or, or maybe HBO or Cinemax, you know, any yeah. of them. Put, put it out there. <laughs> or so, PBS, any, anybody. Yes. Yes. And so <laughs> Diana, um, I saw a, a clip of an interview with you and you said that your next book, I believe you said it was True Grit Meets the Secret Garden, which is an intriguing mm -hmm. description that fits right in with our True Grit. I know. From you, Brewster you Cogburn. All, that's right. You guys all being, you know, True Grit territory, Arkansas. You know, I think I might actually set it in 1900 San Francisco and I'll, I don't want to blow the plot, but there's a reason for it. Um, so. Number one, I'm more, you know, I'm sort of, I understand that area and I, you know, some of the other issues, but yeah, it'll be an interesting story about a young girl who escapes her suffocating family in San Francisco. And she goes off on this amazing adventure to go find her famous mountain man father who has, yes. And she just wants to prove she's capable of anything. So do you have a title? I don't know. They'll always change it, but I kind of, I'm working with of gold and grit right now. Okay. Cause her name is Goldie. So in, in terms of, I don't think we have any more questions here, but so uh, in terms of literature, we know we have chick lit, which is supposedly women's literature. And I read a lot of grit lit, which is Southern literature and then no. grit lit. So what would you call your Western style of literature? What, what would be the little catchphrase for that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, they are set in the West, but I, I would just say it's historical fiction. So I don't know. It, it will definitely have a setting with a Western flair. It's what I know, but who knows? I mean, I've got other book ideas set in, you know, the Smoky Mountains and things like that. So I'll probably roam around, but I just love historical fiction. I love, you know, researching characters and just, you know, I don't know. It's what I love. It's what I love to read. So I'm going to keep on writing it. 
Well, and in that same interview, I, I've read or I heard about your Lord Byron book, that mm -hmm. your almost book. And so I hope that maybe you can get that working someday. So that I think well, that would be you. really interesting. Talk yes. about your interesting characters. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, let's see. I don't think we have any more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got about two minutes to get any chat questions or comments in. I want to thank our presenters for giving their time today, especially being on the road is having to come to us from your car. So, and maybe <laughs> yeah. next year we'll all be in person and get to, to meet. So Wouldn't that'd be nice. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm just glad you're not living in your car. I was worried at first. <laughs> Authors, you know. Yeah, we do what we have to. <laughs> Struggling artists. So. That's right. But I told her it's a great thing that shows that she's a working author because she's out on the road that's, promoting. That's so. right. I am. I'm going to be in uh, Missoula, Montana on Sunday tomorrow between two and four with a book talk signing books. So that's where I'm headed and I'm going to make it no matter what. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks to everybody for participating and make sure you check out these books you can buy them through the the cows i believe that um sick bridges has has purchasing capability that way and also through wordsworth yes if you hold up your books there's a glare on my screen so if y'all hold up your books hell on the border by sydney thompson and you belong here now mm -hmm. by diana rostad so yep so thanks for joining us joining us and we hope you attend more sessions and enjoy your time with cows Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Everyone, thank you.